Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Red Eagle Politics. Make sure you like this video down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new. So we had primaries take place last night in seven states, and the results are kind of a mixed bag. There were a lot of very, very good results that took place, though. They kind of flew under the radar that we were not expecting. So overall, I would have to say that the night was indeed a net positive for America first candidates and ideals, which is a very good thing in my opinion. Now, I wasn't expecting anything big at all to come out of this, which is why I didn't make a video beforehand. Uh, we knew that it was an uphill battle in New Jersey to get rid of Chris Smith and some of these other more establishment candidates, and the same thing went for South Dakota, Mississippi, etc., you name it. However, the results were much better than we expected, and a lot of representatives who may have won that are weak have at least at a very minimum got put on notice, which is the silver lining as well. So we are going to dive into this. But first, I have to tell you guys about our very good friends over at Noble Gold. So with inflation at 8.5% and maybe higher, don't you think you need to be smarter with your money? You need to grow, not shrink. You need freedom, not debt. Start a gold IRA with Noble Gold now and you'll be safe. And this month for every cash deal above 20 k you'll get an incredible 3-ounce silver American Virtue coin completely free as a thank you. You can't go wrong with Noble Gold. Call 877-646-5347 now to find out more or visit noblegoldinvestments.com. So here we go. We're going to start off by talking about Mississippi. Now it's ironic because if you look at the tagline that the New York Times put up here, it said the state's four House members are seeking re-election, all are facing primary challengers, but are expected to receive their party's nominations. Now, honestly, at the surface level before last night, I would have agreed with that. It doesn't seem like any of the Republican candidates that were running really seemed to be facing a steep opposition. Uh, you saw guests, there were no polls for him. Palazzo, he was at 63 in the most recent poll, even though it was taken several months back. So things did change. And obviously, Trent Kelly did win the first district. He's probably the least controversial or the least rhino out of the three, as many people could say. But uh, either way, he faced a primary challenge, but he won easily. Uh, the Democrat won their primary very easily. But then on the other side of things, Republicans, wow, what happened here? Uh, Stephen Palazzo in the fourth district didn't even get a third of the vote. And Michael Guest fell into second place. And then this guy, Michael Cassidy... He won this district, at least in terms of a plurality. Now, there are runoffs in Mississippi, which is going to be a good thing, in my opinion, because turnout will be lower. The grassroots energy will be higher. Michael Cassidy, he's surging. I mean, he might even get Trump's endorsement now in a runoff. And you see Stephen Palazzo failing. He only got 32. He's dead on arrival in a runoff. He'd be lucky if he breaks 40%. Mike Easel, the candidate there that's running uh, in that district, seemed to... Uh, you know, only get 25%, but a lot of other candidates were facing off against Palazzo as well. And I think that they would all come together at the end of the day and support Easel for the most part in the runoff. But either way, I think the third district is more impressive. Palazzo had a corruption scandal. We understand that. Uh, he voted for jab databases. We, we understand that he's a weak individual, very establishment guy. Uh, on the surface, not the worst representative in Congress, but still the fact that you could get him out and get somebody better in there is a massive step in the right direction. We love to see it. But the third district, I think, is more impressive. Michael Guest is more of a rhino. He's been weak his whole entire career on immigration. He also uh, voted for the 1-6 commission. He's very liberal, especially the fact that he represents a district in rural Mississippi in the Deep South. You would expect him to be a hardliner, but no, a lot of these representatives in these uh, southern states are fairly weak. And a lot of them got by. We saw French Hill get by in Arkansas, among you know several other weak candidates get by across the South so far. However, Mississippi is coming through. And Michael Guest didn't even get 47% of the vote, which is saying something because last time we were hoping that maybe we could knock him off uh, and get James Tulp, who was a very solid candidate, very good, America first on the issues, immigration, etc. Impressive. He only got like 12% or so. 
And then this time, Michael Cassidy, who I didn't know about until last night, uh, was running for this district, and he actually got more votes than Guest in the first round, and I guarantee you he'll win the runoff, especially as the Griffin votes probably are going to be voting against Guest in the runoff as well. So keep that in mind, but it's very impressive. Guest is weak. Guest is awful. I think he's worse than Palazzo. And the fact that he was knocked off despite being a total powerhouse is pretty epic. Now, he could still win the runoff, but it's unlikely. And you look at Michael Cassidy's platform, it's phenomenal. I mean, immigration. Look at what he wants to do on immigration. 10-year immigration moratorium. We want more moratorium candidates. We have Gosar. We have MTG. Now you're going to have Michael Cassidy because if he wins the primary, he's going to win the general election. He is a hardliner on immigration. Very good. Uh, wants to you know deport all the illegal aliens, which is following the law, basically, and birthright citizenship, mandatory E-Verify nationwide, total immigration moratorium, legal or illegal, which is good. He's right. He basically talks about the, you know, foreign-born citizens voting 80% Dem. You know, that's Tucker Carlson level stuff. Supercharged uh, Carlsonism, you could say. You love to see it. Um, very good on the children issue. Wants to ban puberty blockers. Wants to basically require uh, companies to have an optional parental control for social media, which I think is also, um, which is also very important in my opinion, especially you have the iPad kids generation. It's a train wreck, but just going on looking at this guy's platform, it's definitely very solid. And furthermore, he goes further. He wants to uh, do the Orban family growth policy here in America, which would be huge. You look at our birth rates below replacement level, which is 2.1. I think, what are we at? Like 1.7, 1.8 now. Now he wants to incentivize families to get married and to have kids and give newlyweds with $20,000. You know, I think that's like the improved, more conservative right-wing concept of like Yang Bucks. It's pretty epic and basically is paying wives to stay home and raise their children. I think that that's a very important policy, something that we've needed in this country for so long and actually use the power that we potentially can have to restore the family, to restore traditional values. And you look at the fact that Michael Cassidy is somebody who wants to go out there and do that. I think it is a very very good step in the right direction that we have people that are running for office that are fighters that want to take on the immigration problem, that want to take on the cultural decay problem, that want to take on the lack of a nuclear family problem. Like this is important stuff. And now you have somebody in a very conservative district who will never lose that district ever that's going to be in Congress probably for the next who knows 10 years at least fighting for that. You absolutely love to see it. So beyond that point, uh, let's get into some of the races that were more of a mixed bag. Iowa, Chuck Grassley won easily, uh, which is not unsurprising. Uh, and the third district went heavily for Zach Nunn there. He won with nearly 70% of the vote, uh, which again shows that you had a very unified uh, primary field behind him in that district. He'll probably uh, win in November, giving Iowa four Republicans in the House yet again in Montana. Uh, they're still counting votes. Ryan Zinke is ahead of Al Olsweski, who is also running a fairly grassroots campaign. Zinke himself is not bad uh, overall, so whoever wins that district wins that district. They're going to be winning in the general. Uh, so really nothing to see here. Then in New Mexico, Mark Ronchetti won the primary easily for governor. And also Republicans improved vastly since 2018 for turnout in New Mexico. Democrats saw a dip in turnout for their races, although admittedly uh, they did not have the governor's primary contested, but they did have the AG field contested. So it's important to take that into consideration. So now let's get to the bad news that happened last night. And it wasn't unexpected bad news, but the establishment favorites won in New Jersey. Uh, Thomas Keene, he beat Phil Rizzo. Phil Rizzo was the better option, in my opinion, better on the issues, but Keene was very hard to beat. He's, you know, his name is a powerhouse in that state, but he is a fairly weak Republican. He probably will win the district in the general, but uh, you could have had somebody better in, especially in this red wave year that could have won that seat. Jeff Van Drew won easily after voting for the bloated infrastructure nonsense bill that Biden passed through. Uh, Chris Smith won as well. He won by 21 points over Mike Crispy. 
which on the surface level, you could say, hey, this isn't really you know that bad. He was at 57 for somebody who didn't impeach Trump. That wasn't that bad, especially because Crispy came in late. He joined the race in January. He still got nearly 40%. And that is true. I think Crispy's going to knock Smith off next time, believe it or not. He was, you know, Crispy's a great candidate, very solid on the issues, America first through and through, but was underfunded. Uh, Next time, I think he will beat Smith or he will win the open primary field if Smith does decide to retire and he puts Smith uh, on watch for sure. But I will say that it's frustrating because if Donald Trump endorsed Crispy against Smith, who has not voted in, in favor of Trump's agenda, has been a very weak Republican for decades now, if Trump went out there and endorsed Crispy, regardless, I'm almost sure that Crispy would have won, or at least it would have been very, very close. And the fact that Trump didn't endorse Crispy because he cares so much about, oh, my endorsement record, you know, if I endorse these candidates in a primary and they end up losing, it's like, who cares? cares. You have to endorse the best candidate regardless. You can't stay out of races because, oh, you you don't want to look bad in terms of your endorsement record. Like, I don't care about Trump's endorsement record. I want him to endorse people that are the best candidates and he can help out the best candidates by doing so. And yes, that doesn't mean they're guaranteed to win, but I'd rather have him have like a 50% endorsement record if it means that we could have several more solid representatives in Congress. Of course, people are going to be like, well, Trump's influence is declining, but they already say that anyways. Like, Trump has nothing to lose by endorsing the best candidate in every single race that he possibly can. I mean, it's one thing to avoid somebody who's down there at like 1% or so because they probably will never have the resources to really get to the finish line. I understand that. But beyond that point, you look at somebody like Mike Crispy. He had the resources. This district... Um, you talk about him winning in the general, he would win in the general easily. It's a heavy Republican district and he had a chance in the primary given the final results. So it's very sad that Trump views politics through that lens. Another example of this is South Dakota. There was no candidate to take on John Thune. John Thune is not popular. Uh, Trump hates John Thune. He didn't endorse him, but he didn't endorse anybody else as well. Uh, you look at the fact that there was no candidate recruited. He tried to recruit Christy Noem to run for that Senate seat. And Christy Noem, we understand how much of a letdown she can be. She's owned by Sanford Health, is very weak on the transgender sports issue, is very weak on immigration, is just a full-out corporatist libertarian type of individual. And, you know, she won the primary with minimal opposition, but uh, who knows? At least she's been put on watch a little bit. And you look down ballot at the, uh, I guess you would say the state Senate and state House races. She was trying to field a lot of challenges to these uh, America first representatives and senators that were uh, trashing her and posing a threat to her agenda. And thankfully, the good incumbents ended up winning uh, in the South Dakota state legislature primaries, which is a good thing to see. And also Dusty Johnson the very unfortunately named individual, you can cue the vulgar jokes, insert them here, but uh, he won with nearly 60% of the votes. So he did uh, worse than he did in the past, which is good. But again, if Trump would have endorsed Taffy Howard, you could have gotten out Dusty Johnson and he wouldn't be in Congress anymore. But Sadly, the endorsement record, even though he stayed out of it, you know, it's better than nothing. It's better than endorsing Johnson, but it's like, come on, man, you can't do this. You got to you gotta take a stand and endorse these candidates that will improve your agenda and help out your base. So beyond that point, the last thing I wanted to talk about was California, and I don't want to touch on it too much because, yes, a lot of the election results have not been tabulated. It'll take two weeks because it's California. That's not even a joke. Like, it probably will take two weeks. You have 50% of the governor's race in Newsom got 56% uh, so far, which is fairly weak. It's weaker than I think what he got in the recall, but uh, we'll have to wait and see as more results are tabulated. I don't want to jump the gun and try to overanalyze it, but Republicans so far from the looks of it did fairly well in terms of their total percentages in a lot of these races, but the notable races took place in LA and San Francisco where Rick Caruso got the most votes. A lot of people are saying that he's the more moderate option compared to Karen Bass, who was briefly considered to be Biden's VP in 2020, if you guys don't remember that. But Rick Caruso uh, easily, probably, I think, is going to end up winning in the general election that takes place there in round two in November. But also the LA Sheriff's race, Alex Villanueva, 
He is very divisive. He moved to the right after his initial election. He has several, you know, scandals that have damaged his reputation there, but he hasn't been that bad on crime because he has moved to the right and he still finished in first place. So we'll see if he ends up winning in the second round, uh, but either way, it's interesting. At least he advances. So, But the big news out of California was actually the San Francisco District Attorney recall. Very corrupt and very weak on crime, Chesa Bowden, or however you pronounce her name, ended up losing big time. Yes, the results have not finished tabulating, but it's 60-40, yes, right now to recall and to remove her, which I think is a very good thing. And even in these liberal places like San Francisco, like Seattle, you see the DAs that are weak on crime and the, the candidates for office, sheriff, whatever, that are weak on crime actually losing. And it kind of just speaks volumes to how unpopular the far left, like burning level policies truly are. And being weak on crime does not help people. And the constituents of these places are turning against these woke progressive DAs, which is an interesting thing to see. But beyond that point, uh, Mike Garcia, only a third of the vote is in right now, but he has a near plurality. Republicans in that district are getting like 54% of the vote, which is pretty epic. David Valadeo is probably going to advance to round two in the 22nd district, which again, you could say it's disappointing because he is a rhino, but it was very, uh, very unlikely that he would lose that district. I mean, Trump didn't even endorse a challenger, uh, but maybe it could go to a DR runoff. But if, if Valadeo is not the nominee, it's going to be hard for Republicans to win that district. But beyond that point, looking at some of these other races, Michelle Steele won her primary big. Young Kim, I believe, is going to be advancing to round two uh, as well. So a good night for incumbents so far on the Republican side in the state of California, which again, depending on how you look at it, could be a good thing or a bad thing. But either way, this state is by far beyond saving. But either way, a mixed bag for Republicans. You had some good results. You had some mad results. You had some weak results, but nothing necessarily that was surprisingly weak like what we saw in Georgia in the Secretary of State race or the margin for what we saw for the governorship. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching this video. Like this video down below, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media and join the website and buy the merch. The links are all in the description down below. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.